solar geoengineering rests on a simple idea. The climate change is caused by the gradual accumulation of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, which trap some of the sun's energy, warming the planet and changing the climate. We could potentially reduce some of that climate change, not just warming, by making the Earth more reflective, and so reducing the amount of solar energy that the Earth absorbs. One way this could be done would be to put aerosols in the upper atmosphere. These are fine droplets or particles that reflect some sunlight away, just the way cloud droplets reflect sunlight. Evidence from basic physics, from uh, observations of the natural world, and from the detailed state-of-the-art climate models that tell us something about the risks of the accumulating carbon dioxide in our atmosphere today, evidence from all three of these shows us that doing a little bit of solar geoengineering could substantially reduce real climate risks we care about that will affect individual people living today. For example, it would reduce precipitation, reduce the intense rainfalls that can cause devastating floods and, and horrific conditions for people around the world. It could reduce peak temperatures, temperatures which can cause crop failures, already are causing crop failures, and which can kill people in large numbers, as particularly the most vulnerable and poorest people in the world, as we saw in India this summer. And it can reduce the rate of sea level rise, sea level rise that threatens uh, uh, marine ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, and small villages around the world, as well as the campus on which we stand today. Solar geoengineering has the potential to do these things, but we have no research program, no large-scale effort to look at how well it might work, what its risks are, how we can rate, make the risks smaller, and how we might manage to, to make governance decisions about such a potentially dangerous technology in a divided world. This talk is my case for such a research program. So, to provide you with some example for how this might work, not an optimal plan, we don't have one, an example. Suppose we wanted to cut the rate of climate change in half starting five years from now in 2020. We would probably use sulfate aerosols. We'd put sulfates into the stratosphere where they form sulfuric acid aerosols. The reason we'd use that is we know it works from experience with nature. Nature already puts sulfur into the stratosphere continuously, and occasionally a big volcano puts a lot of sulfur in the stratosphere, and the planet cools down. So it's one of the things we know for sure would work, but there are lots of ways we might do it better, and plenty of risks of doing that. We would have to start by putting 20,000 tons of sulfur in the stratosphere the first year, the next year 40,000, the next year 60,000, going on up. After 50 years, we'd be putting a million tons a year of sulfur in the stratosphere. That might seem like a scary number, and there's no question there would be real environmental risks of doing that, but here's some perspective. We put 50 million tons of sulfur in the lower atmosphere today, 50 times that amount, with enormous environmental consequences, but the consequence per ton is much less in the stratosphere and benefits much larger. And a big volcano like Pinatubo that cooled the planet put 8 million tons in a single year. So ramping up to 50 million tons over half a century is something that we have some empirical basis to think about on which to think about the risks and some reason to believe those risks are pretty small. And as I'll get to, there are potentially better ways to do it. So why stop at 50 years? Why this ramp to 2070? The answer is that's a reasonable amount of time under which we could rebuild our energy system to bring emissions to zero. If we can bring emissions to zero sooner, great then we can stop increasing solar geoengineering sooner under this scenario. Let me be clear. There is no way that we can use the atmosphere as a free dump for carbon dioxide and expect to have a good climate simply by reflecting away some sunlight. Solar geoengineering is a supplement to emissions control, not a substitute. It is not a quick fix. But the combination of solar geoengineering and emissions control can get us outcomes that we cannot get from emissions control alone. That's an important thing to think about. It is not just a substitute. Here are some examples of those. So we could be confident with the combination that we would have a cooler 2100 than we have today. That we'd have less climate change in 2100 than we have today. We cannot be confident of that by cutting emissions. Even if we cut emissions to zero tomorrow, which is essentially impossible. Even if we do, there are enough feedbacks in the system, so-called 
carbon cycle feedbacks, that the warming we've already created may, for example, warm some of the permafrost and release a little bit more carbon. So the net temperatures in 2100 would be larger than they are today. We'd have more climate change than we do today, even if we cut emissions to zero. We could only be confident that we won't exceed the current temperature if we had the ability, if we needed it, to do solar geoisheering. sharing. We wouldn't necessarily need it. Many of you have heard about the idea that there's a two degree C threshold for dangerous climate change. The truth is that's actually a pretty arbitrary number, but it's politically very important. It'll be one of the big topics in the upcoming meeting in Paris. The only way one could be confident of reaching that topic, that, that target, is to have the combination of emissions cuts and the ability to do solar geoengineering if we needed it. Finally, if you want to protect many of the world's most beautiful ecosystems, high alpine ecosystems with glaciers or the high Arctic, both places where I've spent a lot of time traveling and I love, the only way you're going to do that is got to involve the ability to do solar geoengineering as well as cutting emissions. So this idea is often thought of as a kind of a bad idea whose time has come. An idea that is somehow speaks to our ethical failure to cut emissions. And let me be clear, we have had a hideous ethical failure to cut emissions. My generation and the generation before me have done essentially nothing but talk. We've left the problem for you kids. But solar geoengineering is not simply a factor of ethical failure. And it's not just a bad idea whose time has come. And the reason is that we can get to better environmental outcomes than we can otherwise. So the combination of solar geoengineering and, uh, and cutting emissions can get us to a world where we have something like the pre-industrial climate in two human lifetimes. There's no other way we can do that. Let me be clear about that by picking up again what would happen in 2070. So let's say we get to 2070, we've stopped emissions, Carbon dioxide concentrations are constant. Now what do we do? We could simply gradually remove the solar geoengineering and accept the climate change, but at least it would happen much more slowly than without it, and that would mean less overall suffering. Or we could figure out how to slowly remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and that would allow us to get back to the pre-industrial climate in two lifetimes. That's a fundamentally positive environmental goal and one that cannot be reached by emissions cuts alone. So how possible is this? I talk about moving 20,000 tons a year of sulfur to the stratosphere. Is that something we can realistically do? The short answer is yes. We, for example, paid an aircraft engineering company to do a consulting study to look at this. And their conclusion was that getting that material is easy. They might do it with a modified business jet with a, a low bypass engines. And in the first year, you'd need something like uh, two of those aircraft. And after 50 years, you need about 40 of them. That's assuming no improvement in aircraft technology in 50 years, which is not a likely outcome. The cost of this after a couple decades would be something like a billion dollars a year. That may seem like a big number to you, but the costs of climate damages are estimated to be more than 1% of GDP late this century. That's a trillion dollars a year. So that should put you in some perspective. At this point, solar geoengineering is still just an idea. Albeit it's an idea, with roots that go back 50 years, was first proposed in the 60s. It's an idea where in the last few years we've seen hundreds of scientific papers. It's an idea that could crudely be implemented right now if people wanted to, but it's still an idea. If we wanted to turn this into a technology, a technology that, was, that we could make sensible decisions about, a technology that we were able to give serious independent risk assessment so we could understand how well it worked, if we were going to do that, we would have to, we would have to have a serious research program. And this talk is an argument for having such a research program. Research could make surprisingly fast progress. And the reason is that research would build on existing science we already have. It would build on aerosol science, on atmospheric science, on climate research, and aerospace engineering. And this is by no means just a science problem. The hardest problems here are governance how we control such a high leverage technology in a divided world. But here again, research would not start in a vacuum. Research on the social sciences of solar geoengineering would build on a huge literature on climate policy, understanding how countries can work together to form coalitions to get things done, on environmental law and policy, on environmental ethics, on understanding human uh, uh, reaction to risk. So these are the specific reasons we think we could make very fast progress.
I'll give you a couple specific examples. In our lab, we're thinking of things that might be lower risk than sulfates. So for example, we've looked at whether diamonds in the stratosphere could actually have lower risk, and it looks like they could. They might be able to produce the same amount of cooling with much less impact on the stratosphere, much less change in the stratospheric circulation, uh, less than half the ozone loss. There are other ways we have that actually could make more ozone. So we'd be both doing solar geoengineering and uh, uh, dealing with another environmental problem, the ozone depletion problem. You might think it's a fantasy because diamonds are so expensive, but we're talking one gram per person per year when you start ramping up. And you can go on alibaba.com today and buy diamonds of the relevant size for 10 cents a gram. And I'm sure if we had a large scale program, we'd find cheaper ways to do it. I don't want to think that the diamond thing is that serious. We've got one academic paper. Who knows? Might be totally wrong. Plenty of other ideas. The point is that a research program is needed if we want to see what those ideas are. You might ask, can we test any of this? Does it have to be all theory? The answer is, of course we can test. We're actually making laboratory tests just a few blocks from here. But myself, Professor Jim Anderson, and Professor Frank Koich, who collectively are one of the more successful groups in the world that have tried to understand stratospheric chemistry. Jim Anderson was one of the leaders in understanding the cause of the ozone hole. We're, we've developed specific plans for experiments, something called the Stratospheric Controlled Perturbation Experiment, SCOPEX. That experiment would tell us a great deal about how this technology could work, what its risks are, could surprise us in ways that it wouldn't work. Because one thing research may find is this doesn't work very well. The whole point of research is to reduce our ignorance. But that test would not itself be changing the climate. In the Scopex test, we would put less than 10 grams of sulfur in the stratosphere. That's what you put in two or three minutes of flight of a regular commercial airliner flying to Europe. Our colleagues at University of Washington have a similar set of safe experiments they could do to test another solar geoengineering idea, the idea that sea salt sprays could make marine clouds a little bit wider. There are more ideas. Hopefully, I've excited you with some of these research ideas. But let me be clear, there is no active research program. In the US, whole budget, there is no program. There is now a million dollar a year program in China and a few in Europe, but they're tiny. It might be that the total number of people working worldwide on reducing the risks of solar geoengineering are less than 10 full-time equivalent people. This for a technology that, if it worked, could reduce risks of climate change with a monetary value of order a trillion dollars and enormous benefits to human lives and to the environment over this century. Why? This topic has been a taboo. For years, we were told not to talk about it, and many of us still are told not to talk about it. The reason for the taboo, the underlying concern, has been a fear that if we talk about it, people will lose their focus on cutting emissions. I believe that view is both uninformed and potentially unethical. First of all, it's an empirical question what people's reaction will be to new technologies like this. We're actually doing some empirical research on that. So when you give people a new, potentially risky technology like this that reduces some other risk, it makes the first risk, the risk of climate change, more salient. That may make them actually more willing to work to cut emissions. And there are lots of ideas about how solar geoengineering and emissions cuts could be combined to make it easier to get climate policy done. But nevertheless, there is no program. And to be clear, we spend two and a half billion a year in the US alone on climate change research. We spend maybe 50 billion on clean energy. We should spend a lot more. And all we're talking about here for solar geoengineering would be a research program of order a few tens of millions of dollars a year, which would have enormous potential benefits, or it would teach us this technology didn't work, which itself would be useful. So perhaps I have convinced you that we should just go out and do this thing, because it's so potentially useful. If so, I apologize. That would be crazy. We don't have an adequate monitoring system. We don't have a serious plan for how we would implement. We don't have a serious concerted set of independent efforts to critique and poke holes in that plan for implementation, which we do not have. We do not have in the, even the beginning of institutions to govern this technology. So to start today would be nuts. That's not the decision that faces us. The decision that faces us today is about research. Or perhaps you already believed, or my talk has convinced you, that this technology is sort of fundamentally unethical and we shouldn't do it. Fine. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm right. It doesn't matter. You cannot uninvent this technology. 
our children will be faced with decisions about climate change and about solar geoengineering, whatever we believe today. If we choose not to have a research program, we give them the gift of ignorance and they will make decisions on that basis. That is what we have collectively decided to do. So I ask you to ask your governments that we have a serious systematic research program, one that is diverse, one that is open, one that is internationalized and non-commercial, a research program that most of all looks to understand what the risks are and to figure out all the ways this will not work a research program that at least spends some effort trying to figure out how to reduce the risk and how to do it better, and a research program that builds international institutions capable of figuring out how we might manage a technology like this in a divided world. Thank you.